read his stuff. Uh, you know, he uh, he had this first book, Pebble, that came out in 2006. It's got some fantastic short stories in it. Many of them published in a number of journals, including like One Story, which is one story that comes out, you know, like, once, uh, once a month. Three weeks, yeah. yeah, every three weeks. So yeah, and um, yeah, and then, and then most recently he's got this, he's got this first novel, Cradle, which is 200 pages, and it manages to pack a heck of a lot of great stuff in there. And uh, it's it's touching, but not in a bullshit way. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, which is really refreshing and great. So it's um, so yeah, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm humbled to be up here introducing uh, Patrick Somerville, ladies and gentlemen. Touching but not a bullshit way is probably the best introduction. I <laughs> um, thank you to my friend Colleen O'Brien, wherever she is hiding somewhere, for reading before. That was great, Colleen. And thanks to Jonathan and all the Featherproof people to help make this event. And thanks to the bookseller, which is, I agree with Jonathan, it's the, it's the best bookseller in Chicago. Well, I think it is. And of course, the beard lift. I mean, I can't even speak about the beard lift. It speaks for itself, what happened up here. But remember, you can still add to it. And when I'm done reading, too, I, I hope that everybody hangs out and mingles. And there's plenty of wine from Little Brown for us to drink. I hope we drink it all, because that would mean extra po profits for Susie, and that would be terrible. Be terrible. I think we should drink it all immediately tonight. And then I'm just going to read the first chapter. I think you should get a pretty good sense of what the book is about. And uh, I don't know, I think that'll be it. Then we can just hang out afterwards. So uh, without further ado, I'll just read the chapter. It doesn't need any introduction, I hope. Chapter one, The Cradle. Marissa could not be comforted and wouldn't have it any other way. The cradle for the coming baby had to be the cradle she'd been rocked in as a child. Not only the cradle she'd been rocked in, but the cradle that was upstairs in her bedroom when she was 15 and her mother came home one night from the grocery store, slammed her keys down on the countertop, slammed the brown crinkled bag onto the table, looked down at the floor, looked at Marissa, took the keys, and walked out the door, this time permanently. Ten days later, there'd been a robbery at the house. Wouldn't you know it, many of Mrs. Caroline Francis's favorite things had been stolen, and not very many of anyone else's favorite things had been stolen. So Marissa and her father had always assumed the robbery had been Mrs. Caroline Francis's transparent version of getting what she wanted for the start of her new life without having to walk in and see anyone or do a painful thing like say goodbye. The cradle was taken that night. They said the cradle came from the Civil War. Matt had never believed that, no matter how many times he'd heard the story. What poor family living outside of Milwaukee had Civil War relics in their home? And furthermore, who used such things, if they even existed, for actual children? Also, what exactly did a Civil War cradle look like? Did it have guns on it? Were there Confederate and Union flags carved into the headboard? What antique dealer had ever confirmed its origin? Had it been to Gettysburg? And whose baby was in it back then? Ulysses S. Grant's? Or the child of some Wisconsin soldier from the prairie who had gone south to fight and never come back? There, were no, there was no story attached to it, and no good reason why the Francis family should have been so caught up with it. But they were, and Marissa wouldn't have it any other way. She so told him this, when she told this to him, eight months into her pregnancy, her belly taut and round like a globe. It was June 1997, hot, and Matt was killing himself at work. He'd been taking whatever double shifts anyone at the plant dangled in front of him, just to store up enough money for the baby. He had no idea what it meant for the kid to come, and no idea what it was going to feel like once it came. So the one thing it made sense for him to do, he figured, was put his head down and get money in the bank and leave the understanding to Marissa or her father, two people who seemed to know quite a lot on the subject. They were drinking lemonade on the back porch when she told him that the baby would be requiring the cradle. She said it with her hand on the glass, staring at Matt straight in the eyes. He said, well, how am I supposed to get it? It's not like she broke it up into firewood. She still got it. Well, that doesn't matter if we don't know where it is, he said. I think you'll be able to find it, she said. I don't want to find her. I don't want to see her. I don't want to know how you do it, where she is, but you can. If you look hard enough, you can find anything. You're mad. What about my keys? I look for six hours, then you get home, and you find them in five minutes. Marissa aimed her dark countenance at him and waited. Her eyes were a deep chocolate black, like her hair, back now in a loose ponytail. She had a little birthmark that hugged her right nostril and freckles up beneath her eyes. 
In the last month or so, her skin had taken on a new tone, not exactly a new color, but rather a new timbre, infused with a ruddier health and light. She was not smiling. That's not the same thing, I'm sorry. I just want you to get it and bring it back, she said. Matt kept looking at her face. He was pleased to go to the grocery store and get her pickles in the middle of the night. He did suspect she was making it up half the time, of course. <laughs> but half the time she wasn't really feeling any food cravings, but was just acting out something about pregnant women she'd seen on television. <laughs> but he rolled out of bed and did it every time and never said one word. Fine. Going off to find her mother or an ancient cradle, though, was different. He looked up at Glenn, his father-in-law, who was manning the grill about 15 feet away and who was too deaf to overhear the conversation. What will your father think? He asked. I haven't said anything to him, said Marissa. I don't know what he'll think. Maybe you should say something? He might have things he wants you to get back to. Baby, he said, shaking his head at her grin. I can't tell if you're joking right now or not. <laughs> well, just because I'm laughing doesn't mean I'm joking, she said. That's rarely the case. You know me, man. The baby needs it. Why, he said. Because it matters, that's why, said Marissa. Because every time I think about him in the world, I think about him inside of it. I don't want him growing up in some white plastic piece of trash that we order out of the catalog that came halfway around the world. What lesson do you think we would be teaching by doing that? I was in the cradle, Matt. Well, oh, that's it, Matt said. No one else. It's not as though your family had the thing since the damn Civil War. Your grandma bought it at a yard sale. Well, right there then, she said. There's another link, her hauling it home that day. Where it first came from doesn't even matter. It's what it's done since then. I want it back. You of all people should understand this. Why, he said. You're an orphan. To her, the whole truth of this connection was obvious. How exactly does that relate, Matt said, because it wasn't to him. There are two kinds of people in the world, Marissa said. There are people who understand that everything matters, and people who un don't understand that everything matters. <laughs> How Marissa it was to say that. Matt smiled at her half-heartedly, leaned back into his chair. She was keen on breaking the world into its parts. She wanted its pieces on the table in front of her. Matt didn't know where this habit came from, this analytic aspect of the world. It certainly wasn't her father's way. Her father was all gray and compromised. Maybe Caroline had that to her. Or maybe it happened to you when you had a mother and then suddenly did not. Your mind, shifting miracle that it was, went all the way and compensated with certainty. You lose one of the two people whose duty it is to provide the truth, and you replace her with your own vision of the truth. It has to be strong. You look out at the world and say, yes, it must be this or this, on or off. Better that than nothingness and blur. It matters, what matters? And you think I'm one of the people who understands that everything matters. She nodded. When have I ever said that to you? <laughs> well, I married you, didn't I? She said. If we get a new one, he said, then we can just start again and invest the damn thing with our own new memories, if that's so important. But why do that if there's something better out there already? It's not as though the cradle is going to fill up with too many memories. I want it. Matt saw his father-in-law turn with the four hamburgers on a wooden tray and start walking toward them, looking down at the patties. Two of them had cheese. I don't think you're going to get it back, Matt said. I'm sorry, it's gone, sweetheart. You don't seem to be understanding, Marissa said, <laughs> leaning forward as her father set the tray on the table. She had one hand down on her belly. She was wearing a black maternity top that he'd watched her buy last week. It cost $45, and Matt spent 50